In two weeks, Indonesians will pick a new leader to succeed popular president Joko Widodo. Sebenarnya sih nyesel sih kalau bisa mah tiga periode. The most remarkable legacy that Jokowi has is his uh, infrastructure uh, policy. But instead of fading from the political stage, President Jokowi could have significant sway over the upcoming elections. For the first time ever, a son of a sitting president will run as one of the VP candidates or vice presidential candidates. Could Jokowi's legacy impact how voters vote? And how will his successor govern? He's not just the kingmaker, he's already the king. The king decides who will be his successor. Bandung, the capital of West Java, Indonesia's most populous province. 2.5 million people live in the city, popular among local tourists because of its colonial buildings and trendy cafes. Teten Rahimi was born and raised in Bandung. The 40-year-old parking attendant is a big fan of President Joko Widodo, popularly known as Jokowi. Pak Jokowi itu seperti pembangunan infrastruktur ya, membuat jalan tol, kereta cepat. Dia kan uh, bisa dibangun sama Pak Jokowi infrastrukturnya, bansos, bantuan sosial, BPJS dan sebagainya. Semua berkat dukungan Pak Jokowi aja. Yang penting basis Pak Jokowi is the best Pak, kata saya sama Pak. Like millions of other Indonesians, Teten will cast his ballot on February 14 to choose a new president. He wants someone who can carry on Jokowi's legacy. Susah lah cari presiden seperti Pak Jokowi. Nggak terlalu tinggi, egois. Pak Jokowi nggak, Pak. Orangnya santai, lugu. Mau masyarakat kecil, sebuah itu sama aja sih, Pak. To pick Jokowi's successor, Around 200 million eligible voters will cast their ballots in the world's third largest democracy. It's an enormous undertaking in a country made up of 17,000 islands, stretching over 5,000 kilometers from the east to the west. So the significance of the elections is that in one day, Indonesians will go to the polling stations and elect their president, vice president, uh, the national legislature, so both the DPR, the House of Representatives, as well as um, what, what's known as the regional representatives. And this is a massive exercise. It's over 800,000 polling stations. For the forthcoming presidential election, which for the first time in Indonesian history is we're going to be combined with legislative elections as well. So this is going to be a huge elections, probably the, one, the biggest single day election uh, in the world. There are other firsts in the upcoming contest. It's the first three-horse race since 2009. Looking to succeed President Jokowi are former Jakarta governor Anis Baswedan and his running mate, chairman of the Muslim-based National Awakening Party, Mohaimin Iskandar, Defense Minister Prabowo Subianto and the mayor of the city of Solo, Gibran Rakabumin Raka. Former Central Java Governor, Ganja Pranomo, and Coordinating Minister for Political, Legal, and Security Affairs, Mahfoud MD. And at the moment, there may be no clear out and out winner. The uh, election story in Indonesia is that, that the winning pair must win 50% plus. So it has to be absolute majority. If no candidates win outright, then it has to be a runoff. So there has to be a second round. In the past, that was a bit difficult if you have three more or less equally popular pairs. I think it would be challenging for the voters to figure out who to vote for, partly because now you have social media in a bigger way. More than half of the voters are going to be younger voters. The voting age in Indonesia is 17. Now that's very young. Whether or not they are able to digest all this information from the campaigns and make an intelligent or informed choice about who they want to be their next leader, uh, that's, that's a big question mark. Yang mau dicoblos bajunya? 
What's also different is how much weight the outgoing leader could have on the scales. President Jokowi is stepping down with approval ratings above 70 percent, arguably the most popular president at the time of leaving office. Jokowi ran on a campaign platform about being basically from zero to hero, right? He was a nobody, he wasn't part of the inner circle of any political party elites, he wasn't some big shot like businessman, but he was able to rise to the top basically, right? And the people at that time wanted that kind of figure, they wanted someone who's non-elite uh, and, 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 and uh, perceived as someone who represent them, that's number one. And then secondly, throughout his regime, I guess like his administration, he put a lot of focus on infrastructure projects, all these like mega projects that are very visible. Again, for the kinds of electorates, they perceive whether a president uh, works or like is doing something is through this very visible physical uh, infrastructure projects, right? Jokowi is in, in a very enviable position. Not many leaders who have served two terms and coming to the end who still enjoy huge popularity because he's considered to be successful, particularly in the social economic field. So the infrastructure development people began to enjoy, you know, the, the toll roads, the trains, the ports, the cheaper logistics. But now Indonesia has one of the most ambitious universal health care. People who could not really get hospital treatment because they did not have the money to go there now could get better health care. So that improves also the general health of the people. And, and then the, this targeted subsidies to the poorer households and so on. Another uh, progress, I think, is people see more equality in terms of development. So before this development, very centralized in Java. But now people in Papua, although the road is not finished, in Kalimantan they see a hope for train. So Sulawesi has a train now. Psychology is very important for the regions. The constitution bars Jokowi from seeking a third five-year term. But his popularity could give us another first in the upcoming polls. An outgoing president playing the role of kingmaker in his succession. President Jacobi recently raised eyebrows when he said that presidents can pick a side during the election. He's not just the kingmaker, he's already the king. The king decides who will be his successor. I think the key difference is that we'll have uh, three um, uh, tickets uh, running for the presidential election and uh, of course the controversy is around uh, Jokowi's uh, support, implicit support uh, towards a certain candidate uh, which I think uh, give a different uh, flavor uh, in, in this uh, election compared to the previous years. While not an outright endorsement, Jokowi's eldest son, Gibran, is Prabowo's running mate. Prabowo was Jokowi's rival for the presidency in previous two contests. Prabowo lost in a particularly acrimonious race in 2019. But as an olive branch, Jokowi appointed Prabowo as defense minister, a move that helped heal divisions. While Jokowi is from the Indonesian Party of Struggle, or PDIP, whose presidential candidate of choice is Ganja Pranowo, the general sense is that Jokowi prefers Prabowo to succeed him. People just assume, like in any other normal democracy, that he would be true to his own party. But it turned out that he switched his loyalty and is supporting Prabowo. So I think I mean, if we judge from uh, the perspective of moral or ideal, this is not something ideal. Uh, the president should be more inclusive in terms of pledging his support towards uh, presidential candidates. Gibran's pick as Prabowo's running mate raised many eyebrows. The law says presidential and vice presidential candidates must be at least 40 years old. 36-year-old Gibran's candidacy was nonetheless cleared by a constitutional court on the grounds that he had served as a mayor of Solo. The chief justice in this case, Anwar Usman, is Jokowi's brother-in-law. He has since been dismissed after this ruling was judged an ethical violation. This led to a lot of 
demonstrations and, and criticisms, particularly from the urban elites. But at the recent poll conducted by Compass, you can really see the difference in attitudes. This issue matters. Some 60% of the people in urban areas were very critical of the Constitutional Court. Their trust in the Constitutional Court has really declined. But in the rural area, that has not happened. You know, they continue to have a great trust in the Constitutional Court. That's the first time that he actually uh, let down the, the very electorates who care about the issues that are core because this idea of orang dalam or corruption or nepotism, right, is also something that the common people uh, in Indonesia still don't like actually, right? But what's, um, I guess, surprising is that Jokowi barely took a hit, right? He's still somewhat popular. There's still people who would care about what he thinks or like would, would think in favor of, of, of him. That Jokowi's personal popularity did not suffer from this controversy points to one thing. The victor in the upcoming polls could be whoever is judged to best continue Jokowi's legacy especially his record on infrastructure development and economic growth. Every weekend, Jakarta-based content creator Jia Pija Perdana would visit his wife and two children in Bandung nearly 160 kilometers away. Previously, this journey would take at least five hours from Jakarta to his home in Bandung. But since October, Jia has significantly cut his traveling time. Untuk saat ini, pilihan utama kereta cepat. Pasti karena salah satu alasannya adalah kecepatan waktu ya, yang tidak dimiliki oleh transportasi lain gitu. Dengan kereta cepat ini, saya bisa nyampe rumah itu dengan hanya waktu dua jam saja. Jadi udah Menurut saya sudah sangat sangat memadai lah untuk saya yang long distance relationship ini. With the maximum speed of 350 kilometers per hour, Indonesia's high speed rail is fittingly called Wush. It's popular among Indonesians, attracting more than 20,000 people a day since it started operations in October 2023. The speed train project costs 7.3 billion US dollars, largely funded by China. Under Beijing's Belt and Road Initiative, Wush was one of President Joko Widodo's most ambitious infrastructure projects. Tadi kan kita lihat sama-sama kan banyak orang luar negeri juga kan datang-datang untuk nyobain gitu. Saya sih juga kayak banyak dari luar kota juga datang ke sini, datang untuk memilih transportasi ke Bandung juga kayaknya udah mulai jadi opsi lah, gitu. udah mulai jadi pilihan gitu. Kebanggaan ya, kebanggaan juga kan pertama kali di Asia Tenggara gitu. Jadi kalau bisa kebanggaan pasti bangga banget sih infrastruktur yang paling terasa <laughs> buat saya. Widodo, popularly known as Jokowi, has focused on infrastructure projects, social welfare programs, and economic growth during his presidency. The average GDP growth during his tenure is around 4%, according to the Statistics Bureau. Last year, the World Bank put Indonesia back in the upper middle income category on post-pandemic recovery. Indonesia is doing quite well. We are recovering quite well after COVID. The economy has positive growth and in comparison to many other developing countries, of course, you know, we are slightly still lower than say China or India, but Indonesia is, you know, doing, doing quite really well. Economy is a must for everybody, you know, regardless of what happens outside, creating employment. If you, we realize that over 50% of the voters are millennial and Z generations. That means that they are at the age where they need education and employment. Andiata Ferseli Utami is the co-founder of Bijak Mamili or Choose Wisely, a movement to help the youth get better acquainted with their potential leaders through social media and public discussions. With like top 10 issues that always come up amongst uh, voters under 40, and again, number one, it's always job, but it's not as simple as job provision, right? It's for the younger generation, it's decent, well-paying jobs, uh, ideally green as well, um, um, and so on. 
I think the macro economists would care about the number of like economic growth, but layman, like everyday people would care about whether it means that I can get a job and whether it means I can make a uh, better uh, wage over time. To create jobs and reduce poverty, the government embarked on an ambitious infrastructure building spree. The Jacobi administration has constructed 16 new airports, 18 new ports, 36 dams, more than 2,000 kilometers of toll roads, and Southeast Asia's first high-speed rail. Jokowi projects that the economy will hit 7% growth by 2028, but only if his successor adopts his reforms. I think the most remarkable legacy that Jokowi has is his uh, infrastructure uh, policy. You can see that a lot of improvement has been made in the infrastructure sector, including the Jakarta-Bandung high-speed train, a lot of new network of toll roads, not only in Java, but, but also in Sumatra. If you see the economic growth that Jokowi has produced at the moment, it creates some sort of confidence among the Indonesian people, and therefore, when a society is at a, a position of confidence, usually the pendulum swings to the right swings for stability, swings for establishment, and therefore issues like elitism, issues like dynasty, it doesn't matter because people at the moment, what they want is some sort of stability and if possible, policy continuation. But these building projects are not without detractors. In the case of the high-speed rail, Construction costs went over budget by 1.2 billion US dollars. This required the Indonesian government to put up state funds as collateral to secure more Chinese loans. Sounding the alarm that Indonesia could fall into a debt trap. As it is, about 20% of the government's budget this year will be used for interest payments. So one of the complaints or criticisms of Jokowi's presidency is that there's been a lot of infrastructure building but less coordinated or careful planning. So if, if you build infrastructure for the sake of infrastructure or if there are vanity projects, it doesn't get your country to a higher developed status. It just means very messy roads where maybe your infrastructure projects are meant to benefit people close to you, not necessarily benefit the local communities who are there. Mila Rizmawati runs a restaurant in Subang, West Java, around 130 kilometers southeast of Jakarta. It's located along a network of roads linking the western part of Java with the east. Her business has suffered since the opening of the nearby Chipali Toll Road in 2015, which was part of Jokowi's infrastructure drive. Many customers now bypass the town. Jadi memang pada saat sebelum Cipali itu, ini nih ya, dari sini sampai ke ujung situ, itu bisa tujuh bis full, Bapak bisa bayangin, sekali datang, ya. Padahal tujuh bis itu kalau isinya 40 orang aja, itu berapa orang? Kali satu hari, jadi satu hari itu nggak cuma sekali datang, Pak. During its heyday, Nikmat Restaurant earned around 250 million rupiah or around 21,000 US dollars a month. But income has dropped more than 70% after travelers started to use the toll road, bypassing her restaurant. Other restaurants here have gone bankrupt. The buildings have fallen into disrepair. Kalau kesel ya emang kesel ya, Pak. Dengan kebijakannya, mungkin bukan dengan orangnya sih ya. Karena kan kalau kebijakan itu kan pastinya bukan cuma satu orang atau dua orang. Jadi ya udah kita terima aja. Kondisinya memang sangat berkurang ya sudah oke. Okay. Tinggal kita cari solusinya gitu. Karena yang terdampak kan memang bukan cuma kita aja pak. Itu juga diperhatikan efek dari efek samping ya kalau kita obat tuh efek samping. Jadi ketika ada pembangunan A, tolong dampak di sininya juga gimana caranya untuk bisa tetap terus bertumbuh. As night falls in Subang. City Amina is getting ready to open her cafe not far from Nikamat restaurant. Cafe Saskia offers alcoholic drinks to travelers. It's also a karaoke bar, but business has been slow because of the Chipali toll road. 
pelanggannya ya ada mobil pribadi ya dulu sih tahun 2014 15 sampai 17 AP-AP Singapura juga ada ya Cina ke sini terus ya mobil truk gitu kayak teller sekarang mah semenjak ada tol Cipali gitu dampaknya tamu pri biasa aja yang bawa mau mobil tuh udah jarang These stories show the tensions around infrastructure projects where some may be left behind. In another example, residents of Rempang Island clashed with police last September when it was announced that their land would be transformed into a Chinese-funded economic zone. As for the site of the future capital, Nusantara, some of the indigenous people are concerned about losing their land rights. Kenapa kami jadi getar getir kepastian hukum hak hak kami ini belum ada yang bisa kami pegang keberadaan kami belum ada pengakuan yang secara tertulis dari pemerintah otorita itu sendiri. Sedangkan di sini memang asal usulnya suku kami. And perhaps. No project is more emblematic of Jokowi's infrastructure policy than Nusantara. The plan will move the seat of government from Jakarta to this new, purpose-built city in East Kalimantan province, which will be inaugurated this August. The new capital, Nusantara, or IKN, is estimated to cost 32 billion US dollars. While the new capital could bring a much-needed economic boost to East Kalimantan, there are also concerns that it will be a white elephant. And doubts that the locals will benefit from the new city. Dan kami tidak menolak IKN itu. Kami hanya saja belum bisa mendukung sebelum keberadaan kami, hak-hak kami itu diakui. Untuk apa kami mendukung kami saja tidak diakui? The question now is which of Jokowi's potential successors will continue his flagship project, Nusantara, and development strategy. Probably he will likely continue Nusantara. He, of the three, I think he's probably the most likely. Uh, and it'll, it'll partly be a thank you to uh, Widodo to say, OK, this is your idea. As president, I will continue it. Under a Ganja presidency, things will get done, but slower which is not a bad thing, uh, with more consultation, with more attention to human rights maybe, and more attention to asking the locals or consulting them at least before pushing ahead with um, development. Pak Anis, he has actually voiced his opposition to Nusantara, but sort of countered with the proposal, why don't we make our small cities medium and our medium cities large? Apart from promises to improve the economy, President Jokowi also came into office pledging religious and social reforms. How has he fared? And will his successor take up the baton? Grace Marilyn Jonathans lives in Depok, on the outskirts of Jakarta. Just like many in her congregation, Grace is a descendant of former native slaves who were converted to Christianity by their Dutch masters in the 18th century. Indonesia is a former Dutch colony. Saya di sini sudah semenjak lahir. Jadi saya sekolah. SD, uh, SD di Depok, lalu SMP juga masih di Depok, tapi SMA dan perguruan tinggi saya di Jakarta. Grace, her family and her mother live in the old part of Depok. An 18th century church is the area's main landmark. Christians account for around 10% in mainly Muslim Indonesia. Since the 70s, Depok has attracted settlers from various parts of Java, like Jakarta, slowly turning it into a city of 2.5 million people. While this corner of the city is an oasis for Christians in the area, 
Depok is consistently ranked as one of Indonesia's least tolerant cities by the Satara Institute of Human Rights. Depok is a stronghold of the Prosperous Justice Party, a conservative Islamic party. Intoleransi kita tumbuh karena banyak uh, asupan dari kota, kota metropolitan pindahan gitu loh. Jadi kayak istilahnya kayak ibadah aja kadang-kadang suka mesti minta izin dulu ibadah padahal ibadahnya di rumah sendiri gitu ya bukan di tempat umum. The previous presidential contest in 2019 between Jokowi and Prabowo was especially acrimonious. In particular, hardline Islamic groups showed out for Prabowo and clashed with security forces when he was defeated. President Jokowi's commitment to pluralism helped him win election then, and he pledged tolerance and unity after this victory. Dibandingkan dengan yang sebelumnya sih, iya pasti, iya pasti. Cuman. Mungkin tetap aja ya masih ada yang di daerah-daerah pelosok, mungkin yang belum terjamah, yang belum bisa dijangkau. Nggak boleh lo dirin gereja gitu loh, nggak boleh lo macam-macam. Karena bukan begitu aja, karena saya juga masih ada gereja yang IMB-nya sampai saat ini belum keluar. So I would say under him, certain freedoms are better, certain religious freedoms are better. The fact that uh, Christians can freely practice or Buddhists and Confucianists are not uh, openly discriminated against, yes, but there are certain persistent things like the very tiny Jewish community in Indonesia, partly because of what's going on in Gaza, still cannot you know, openly uh, practice their religion and are afraid to, right, in case anything happens to them. Although 80% of Indonesians are Muslims, the country is officially secular. In addition to Islam, the state recognizes five other religions – Protestantism, Catholicism, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Confucianism. After his victory in 2019, President Jokowi sought to head off the extremist elements that had violently disrupted the elections. He outlawed the hardline group Islamic Defenders Front, or FPI in 2020. Still, ahead of this coming election, the National Police Counterterrorism Unit arrested 59 suspected militants for planning to disrupt the polls. Indonesia has been quite successful in dealing with uh, extremism, violent extremism. Every so often, uh, terrorists have still been uh, identified. Uh, on the whole, Indonesia has been su quite successful in doing a comprehensive approach, both in terms of repression, arresting them, the tourists, as well as de-radicalization, reintegrating them into society. You know, Indonesia has been quite successful in that. Headed into the February polls, President Jokowi urged candidates to refrain from identity politics. All the major parties concurred, and as a result, the current campaign period has been relatively amicable. In terms of this ending the polarization based on identity politics, Jokowi has been successful because he's, been, he's brought all of these parties who have made use of religions and identities for political purposes. That's the identity politics issue. Uh, that, that has been ended but, but, uh, because of this uh, uh, big coalition government. The polarization is still there between people who want Indonesia to become more Islamic and people who want Indonesia to stay plural. It's still there. But in 2019, that pluralization was exaggerated by one side. And that side actually used that theme to get votes. We do not see any candidate in the 2024 election using that theme to get votes. Nasaruddin Umar is the Grand Imam of the Istiqlal Mosque in Jakarta. He was involved in the creation of Indonesia's counter-terrorism agency and has served as Deputy Minister for Religious Affairs. Saya kok lebih percaya apa yang pernah diungkapkan oleh survei Kompas beberapa waktu yang lalu ya bahwa generasi under 30 di bawah 30 tahun itu 
itu lebih plural, lebih demokratis, dan lebih tolerans. Sementara pemilu kita nanti akan datang ini kan, itu sekitar 58 persen ya pemilu pemilih kita nanti itu adalah kaum milenial. Ya. Nah kalau kaum milenial ini yang berpotensi biasanya menciptakan tumpahan emosi, memiliki perspektif yang lebih baik tentang apa arti sebuah demokrasi, maka saya lebih optimis bahwa nanti akan datang ini, insya Allah tidak akan terjadi apa-apa. Ini keyakinan saya. Nonetheless, religious groups still hold a tremendous sway over the electorate able to mobilize millions of their followers to support their chosen candidate. For Nasaruddin, he hopes voters will be moderate in expressing their support. Memiliki tiga kandidat presiden yang memiliki kelebihannya masing-masing, ya kan? Jadi kita harus bangga bahwa yang terpilih sebagai kandidat presiden ini adalah memang orang yang pantas untuk menjadi calon presiden. Sama juga saya kira wakilnya. Nah karena itu bagi kita sebagai warga negara ya, karena ini adalah rutinitas setiap lima tahunan ya, kita jangan sampai nanti menganggap pemilihan umum ini seolah-olah dunia ini mau kiamat, jadi seolah-olah menentukan uh, sangat signifikan hari kita akan datang itu kayak apa ya. Seolah-olah kalau kita kalah nanti dunia ini akan kiamat di Indonesia. As he aligned himself with Jokowi's camp, Prabowo shed his 2019 image as a religious hardliner. There's some disappointments at the ground level, you know, that Prabowo have gone over to the other side and they're unhappy with this. But the fact of the matter is, you know, in terms of social harmony, the issues of identity politics became less important. And among these candidates now, they have tried to overcome this identity politics issue also by embracing uh, uh, the other side. While President Jokowi has had some success in social reform, his record on political reform is patchier. Corruption continues to plague his government, culminating with the arrest of the head of the Anti-Corruption Commission on charges of extortion. Six ministers have also been charged with corruption. Menyatakan terdakwa Joni Garar Plate telah terbukti secara sah dan meyakinkan bersalah melakukan tindak pidana korupsi secara bersama-sama sebagaimana dalam dakwaan primer penuntut umum. Sorry to say, with minimum action on corruption become his strength, political strength, uh, to maintain the, the coalition. Yes, I think it's the biggest shortcomings, the corruptions. I think he will sadly be remembered for the second term where he allowed certain things to happen. So increasing worry about the role of the military, uh, including military officials taking over what used to be civilian bureaucratic positions. So that's, that's a worry. Uh, under him also, the, both the Elections Commission and the Corruption Commission have been weakened in some ways. And because of how large Jokowi's shadow looms over Indonesia's political space, comparisons with the outgoing president have become a strategy on the campaign trail. Anis, right? He compared himself with Jokowi. He came up with plans that is not aligned with what Jokowi wants. So I think that's fair. And you have Ganjar, who aspires to continue uh, what Jokowi has done to Indonesia. But he noted that something have been wrong under Jokowi. And that is around corruption, collusion, nepotism. So he wants to make improvement on that side. Uh, Prabowo, on the other hand, uh, is someone who never say anything about himself. He only said that, I want to continue whatever Jokowi has done. So if you are for Jokowi, you will go to Prabowo. If you're f against Jokowi, you will go for Anis Baswedan. Who will pick Ganjar Pranowo? At this point, only those who also vote for PIP. But how do the candidates compare amongst themselves on their own merits and flaws? In November 2022, 
American President Joe Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping met for the first time as leaders of the countries. The rendezvous happened in Bali at the G20 summit. In the final years of President Jokowi's term, he has worked to raise Indonesia's profile on the world stage. It's been president of the G20, it's chaired ASEAN, it has now definitely got a voice on the world stage and is using it. He was the president that saw that happen. Not that President Yudhoyono did not, but I think under President Widodo, it, it really came to the fore. I think truly today you can say Indonesia is recognized as a, if not a middle power already, it's an emerging middle power. As a result, while Indonesian presidential races tended to focus on domestic issues in the past, this time round, foreign policy was given more attention on the campaign trail. All the leaders, uh, for all the candidates, if we listen to their foreign policy debates, they all emphasize the importance of stability, uh, also regional cooperation, ASEAN. Prabowo, in fact, mentioned good neighborliness. He mentioned about the, the importance of ASEAN. So in terms of the directions of foreign policy, the substance, the commitment to ASEAN, uh, there's nothing to be worried about. Three candidates are vying to succeed President Joko Widodo or Jokowi, whose second and final term ends in October. It will definitely be a regime change because the structure, the leadership style of the new president will be totally different to him. Because in Indonesia, it's all about the personalities and the personalities in the government will change. In polls, Defence Minister Prabowo Subianto is ahead of the other contenders, former Jakarta Governor Anis Baswedan and former Central Java Governor Ganja Pranowo. Prabowo has strengths in terms of his experience, so you cannot deny he's been in national uh, politics and in the national limelight for a very long time. Uh, so of the three candidates, there's probably people who think, you know, he's probably the best or most logical candidate because he knows how things are done. Uh, he's been defense minister, so he knows a lot of world leaders already. He is uh, able to speak in English. He also speaks German. Prabowo, in 2014 and 2019, he portrayed himself, one, as a hard-nosed commander or as the savior of the Islamic majority. Both portrayals sometimes scare off the neutral voters. This time, he is not portraying that kind of image. He's portraying this cute, adorable grandfather who can speak a lot of languages, who can dance and talk to young people. The main island of Java will be the key battleground for the contenders, with its population accounting for around 58% of the voters. Here is where Prabowo's rivals could have an advantage. I think Ganjar has been consistently strong in central Java uh, because of his former stints as the uh, central Java governors. Because of picking Mahfud, um, he is considerably strong in East Java, uh, which is the stronghold of uh, Nahdlatul Ulama, uh, which is an Islamic organization uh, that is affiliated to Mahfud. Meanwhile, Anis's experience as the governor of Jakarta may work in his favor. I would say uh, he has some appeal to the youth, partly of, of his uh, academic background. He has experience talking to young people, and I think uh, his campaign definitely is, is seeing him reach out to, to younger people and talking to people on campuses, um, so that's a strength. Uh, his, his sort of natural constituency or base uh, is sort of built up from his campaign for Jakarta governor, so uh, a sort of natural fit in Jakarta itself, uh, as well as uh, West Java, I think, will be competitive for him. At the same time, each candidate also carries some political baggage. Prabowo was a general during the rule of second president Suharto his former father-in-law. 
Prabowa was dishonorably discharged for alleged human rights abuses in East Timor and in connection to the deadly riots that led to the fall of Suharto's government in 1998. These allegations were not proven in court. It's very clear from polls that people who were born after 1981, um, they have, let's just say, little recollection or little memory about what happened in 1998. Therefore, for them, Prabowo does not mean something negative. It's different than the generation that was born before 1980, who saw how Prabowo was as let's just say, a hard-nosed general. Ganja made headlines for refusing to host the Israeli team in his province during the cancelled Under-20 Football World Cup in 2023. It was a split from President Jokowi's position who backed the tournament. While Ganja is from the same party as Jokowi, the Indonesian Democratic Party of Struggle, or PDIP, He's seen by some as being too closely aligned with the party's chairperson, Megawati Sukarno Putri. Megawati is the daughter of founding president Sukarno. So there are some concerns that maybe when he wins or if he wins uh, as president, that his cabinet may not be his choice. That maybe there's some person behind the scenes deciding who will be his, his minister. Anis was an education minister in Jokowi's cabinet, but was dropped after two years. Later, he won the Jakarta gubernatorial race in 2017, in a campaign that tapped the anger of Muslims against a Chinese Christian incumbent, Basuki Purnama, popularly known as Ahok. Ahok was accused of blasphemy. For the negative side, for Anis, I think there's the fear, the lingering fear that he will use anti-minority or anti-religious um, rhetoric the way he did when he was uh, running against Ahok in 2017. So that's probably the biggest negative I can think of for him. But the three candidates have something in common. To continue developing Indonesia, the Anis Muhaimin team wants to reduce unemployment rate to 3.5% from 5.32%. The Ganja Mafut team has promised to reduce unemployment by creating 17 million jobs. The Prabowo Gibran team also wants to create jobs and encourages young people to set up their own businesses. Indonesia needs to be part of that global value chain. Uh, where it is not just supply of cheap labour that's going to make you competitive. In order to invest in having more value-added Indonesia, uh, it's not just about money, it's not just about importing technology, it's about human resources development in Indonesia, it's about embedding the uh, innovation culture in Indonesia and, and that Indonesia is still lagging behind. I think what will be important for Indonesians will be um, does the president you know, help me get my job? Does the president take care of my family's health? Uh, are my kids uh, eating enough? Do they have scholarship opportunities if we're poor? I think those will be sort of bread and butter things that, that all voters will want to see the next president deal with. On February 14, Indonesians will head to the ballot box. Should no candidate cross the 50% threshold in votes, the top two will head for a runoff in June. It will be the first runoff in Indonesia's history. With Prabowo in the lead, any runoff will likely see the former defense minister face either Anis or Ganja. So if Anis lost the first round, um, the base of the support will go to Ganja. But some people also say that the vote may go to Prabowo because um, a lot of uh, Anis supporters are basically, you know, supported Prabowo when, when, when it was in 2019 and 2014. Many of these um, voters of Ganjar could even go to Prabowo 
Why? Because from a ideological point of view, they're as nationalistic as Prabowo. Jokowi was part of, or is still part of PDIP. Therefore, they have more linkages from an ideological, political, and even background with Prabowo, rather with Anis Baswedan. Indonesia has grand ambitions in the coming years. The archipelago is projected to become the world's sixth largest economy by 2027. It wants to raise per capita income above 10,000 US dollars by 2030 and cut carbon emissions by about 32% in the same time frame. Presiding over these targets will be President Jokowi's successor. And on February 14th, Indonesians will choose who this will be. Sosok Prabowo, kenapa saya milih Prabowo? Karena kalau saya melihat di Indonesia ini uh, karakter yang cocok untuk memimpin Indonesia adalah orang yang tegas. Dengan Prabowo yang basicnya adalah seorang dulu militer, jadi saya rasa dengan uh, pembawaannya dia bisa memimpin Indonesia untuk lima tahun ke depan sih. Setelah mengikuti jejak rekam seorang Anis, saya sepertinya akan memilih Anis. Karena dari beberapa tahun saya melihat kinerja Anis di Jakarta, saya merasakan dampaknya karena saya sendiri bekerja di Jakarta. Mulai dari transportasi, perkotaan, tata, -tata, -tata kelola kota, dan secara perekonomian juga akan lebih meningkat kalau untuk Anis. Ganjar Mahfud menurut saya adalah dari ketiga pasangan ini memang uh, menurut saya pasangan yang paling kompetibel ya daripada yang lain. Dan kita bisa lihat uh, Pak Ganjar uh, terakhir adalah menjabat sebagai Gubernur Jawa Tengah. Saya rasa uh, di sana kepemimpinan beliau memang bagus ya. Walaupun pasti ada sedikit-sedikit beberapa minusnya, cuman overall beliau bagus di Jawa Tengah. <tuh> 